Today's video is sponsored by Raycon Earbuds. I spend a lot of time researching subjects for videos, and I am the type of person that cannot focus in complete silence. I personally have been using Raycon earbuds for quite some time to help me stay focused and not have to worry about any wires getting in the way. Whether it's listening to music I'm going to use in an upcoming video, or a podcast while I exercise, Raycon earbuds truly are some of the best earbuds I have ever used. They feel completely natural in my ears and don't stick out like others do. The new everyday earbuds offer an improved rubber oil look and feel, feeling both high quality and comfortable. They also come with optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. Raycons also offer 8 hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life. On top of that, they have a built-in mic, so taking a phone call or sending a voice message is as simple as pressing a button. The wireless charging base and 8 hours of battery life ensures I won't have to worry about them dying on me every other hour. Water and splash resistance, 3 sound profiles, awareness mode, and the low profile of Raycon everyday earbuds are sure to be a great fit for anyone. They are also, most importantly, available in different colors. Carbon black, electric blue, flare red, rose gold, and frost white. Raycon earbuds start at half the price of other premium audio brands, but sound just as good. Not to mention they have a 45-day happiness guarantee. So, if you want to snag these earbuds for yourself, head on over to buyraycon.com forward slash cadaver to get 20% off your Raycon purchase and experience true premium wireless audio. May 27, 1999, a man by the name of Dale Williams would depart from the auto body shop that he owned to assist someone who called in reporting that they needed their car jump-started. As Dale got into his Ford F-250, nobody knew that it would be the final time anyone would ever see him again. The following day, once his wife Diana realized that he never came home that night, an investigation into the matter would quickly take place that would find the entire community searching for the friendly and helpful father of two. What would unravel would seem like something straight out of a crime novel, as a wrecked truck, a vengeful friend, and a complete lack of any concrete evidence would twist and turn this case until many of the questions that so many had would be left unanswered and remain unsolved for over 20 years. This is the true story of the vanishing of Dale Williams. Dale Williams appeared, by all accounts, a friendly, helpful, and generous man. The father and husband called Nucla, Colorado home. He ran an auto body shop called Pro Body Repair, and while he wasn't a mechanic, he knew a fair amount about cars, and was skilled at car body repair. On the outside, Dale simply appeared to be just an average, normal person, whose life in no way was about to be thrown into a mystery that would go on to remain in this state for over two decades. On May 27, 1999, Dale arrived at his shop and was said to have had a busy day in front of him. The timeline for the 27th isn't the most fleshed out that I have seen, but there are a few witness statements from that day that does somewhat help form a picture around this bizarre case. The first witness sighting was from Dell's friend Tom Ross, a local minister. He arrived at the shop around noon and was seeing Dell about replacing his windshield. While Tom and Dell were talking, a phone call came in for Dell, and Tom recounted that the conversation appeared somewhat stressful. Tom went on to say that from what he could gather, and from Dell's demeanor on the phone, that the person on the other end sounded panicked. Tom would also say that it seemed the person on the other end of the phone was a woman based on how Dell was responding. Shortly before getting off the phone, Dell announced that he would be taking the tow truck to the caller, but the caller declined and stated that they simply needed their car to be jump-started. 
Following this, Dale said goodbye to Tom and both men left the auto body shop and Dale left in his personal vehicle, a Ford F-250. As Dale made his way to the caller's location, which was reported to be in Paradox Valley, around 25 miles from Nucla, Dale did make a stop on his way to help the caller, and that was to speak to a woman by the name of Tammy Lawrence. Her car was to be worked on by Dale that day, and he said the reason for his visit was to let her know that he was going to jumpstart a car out of town and wouldn't be able to start the work on her car until later on in the day. This interaction would be the last confirmed sighting of Dale Williams. Following the remainder of the day, Dale's wife Diana attempted calling him several times, but each time was to no avail. She chalked it up to him simply being busy, which he was supposed to be that day after all. So, a lack of communication wasn't something to be overly worried about. Going into the night, however, Diana's concerns grew for her husband, and while she didn't call the police then, she did have a sleepless night due to her worry. When morning arrived and still no sign of Dale could be found, Diana drove to his shop and found it empty. His tools were there and were left in a way that looked like he was in the middle of working when he suddenly left which would tie up with Tom's version of events, that he stopped by there around noon, so Dale would have been working for at least three to four hours upon Tom's arrival. After not seeing any sign of Dale, Diana then went to her mother-in-law's house to see if he was there, or if her mother-in-law had at least heard from him. When Diana again met with a dead end, she went to a junkyard that Dale visited often, and again, no sign of Dale could be found. By now, worry had grown to full panic. Dell was nowhere to be found, his shop wasn't locked up overnight, and his truck was missing. Diana and her mother-in-law contacted the police, and an investigation began shortly after. Police and the residents of Nucla came together to each work their own investigation. A large number of people were seen searching all over for the missing father and husband. Leads and tips were followed regardless of how insignificant they seemed, and the area of Paradox Valley was searched, and all areas in between. There were also several reported sightings of Dell from that day, but none could be fully confirmed. One being that Dell's truck was seen back at his shop around 2 in the afternoon. Another came from an employee at a grocery store who said she saw Dell there at around 6 that evening. Unfortunately, none of those reported sightings could be proven. For weeks, the investigation into Dell Williams, while thorough, was turning in very few clues, and it seemed that he simply vanished on his way to help the person who called the shop that day. No breaks in the case would happen until a full six weeks after Dell's disappearance, and it would occur on the 4th of July. On the 4th of July, as the United States celebrated with cookouts and fireworks, a family spending the day fishing at the Dolores River were enjoying the day's relaxing nature until one of the family members jumped into the river to retrieve a fishing line when they discovered something more than they ever expected to find. The family had unintentionally found the truck belonging to Dale Williams. Following this explosion in the case, police quickly flooded the scene and were able to get the truck pulled from the river. Thankfully, at least Dell's body was not located in the truck. So yes, they were still dealing with a missing person, but at least there was a possibility he could be alive. The truck was found in around 10 feet of water, and while they were unable to tell how long it had actually been in the river, they were able to determine that the ignition was turned on, the vehicle was in gear, and something that immediately stood out to Diana was the driver's side window. It was reported that Dell always had his window completely down, instead of it just being halfway. While that may not be the biggest clue out there, for Diana to immediately notice it does stand out, and it did for several of those investigating the truck. 
Following the discovery of Dell's truck, it was learned that the location of the river was 25 miles away from Dell's shop. There was also a very sharp turn on the road that bordered the river the truck was found in, and there was no clear sign of any brake marks made on the road. Going even further into the truck is that there was a metal toolbox that had been bolted into the back of the truck bed. The thing that stands out is that that toolbox was missing. The lid of it was later found along with several of Dell's tools. The location of some of these tools was near Bedrock, Colorado, which the Dolores River runs through, so perhaps some of the tools could have washed along with the current. It was also reported, although unconfirmed, that Dell's truck was seen before he was reported missing, between Bedrock and Paradox Valley, on the side of the road with the hood up beside another car. Most assumed that this car was the caller who originally brought Dell out there. Apart from that one reported sighting, no others were made of Dell in that area. Investigators did announce later on that the truck was put into the lake on purpose. However, even though Dell's truck had been found, Dell himself was still missing, and it appeared police were still no closer to figuring out where he could be. The only lead they had to go on was a mysterious caller who requested their car to get jump started. It didn't help that the identity of this caller has remained unknown ever since. Due to lack of many credible leads to follow, the family of Dale Williams had since started their own means of investigating. A part of that investigation was when the family put up missing person flyers around town, one of those places being in the post office. Yet, after a few days, Diana had noticed that the missing person flyers had vanished. Confused, but possibly assuming people had simply taken one until they were all gone, she printed more and again, a few days later, they were all gone. Not feeling right about the situation, Diana worked with the police to set up a camera in the post office to see if they could catch whoever was responsible and find out why. And surprisingly, it worked. A man was seen taking the flyers and throwing them away. Once identified, it was discovered that the man had some very troubling history with both Dale and Diana. History that could for some, easily be seen as motive for Dell's disappearance. The man responsible for throwing away Dell's missing person flyers was actually an ex-friend of his. But there is a big emphasis on ex. The man whose name remains unknown had a very troubled past with Dell and Diana. It was learned that Dell and Diana had actually helped the man's ex-wife move away to another state, and when confronted, Dell wouldn't tell him where she went. The reason due to the ex-wife wanting to flee was due to reported abuse occurring in the marriage, and Dell and Diana decided to help someone who clearly needed it. Refusing to give the ex-husband the information on where she was made for some very stressful months for Dell and Diana. One instance was that Dale found torn up pictures of the man and his ex-wife outside of his shop, along with 22 caliber bullets mixed in with them. Diana had her own encounter, as she found a 22 caliber gun in the mailbox of her job. It was later discovered that both the bullets and the gun were Dale's and had been stolen from his shop. Police questioned the man, and he was obviously a person of interest due to both his history with Dale and what he did to the flyers. Yet, the man did have an alibi for that day, and it seemingly checked out. I have searched to try to find what his alibi was, but I couldn't find anything. Naturally, this guy looks like a major red flag and an obvious choice for a suspect but legally he couldn't be charged with a crime as everything was circumstantial and him throwing away the flyers made him an asshole, sure, but unfortunately, it isn't a crime to be one. This seemingly is where the story of Dell Williams ends. Since the discovery of his truck, there have been no major developments in his case. The grim fate of Dale does seem pretty apparent, but nothing can be proven, even today over 20 years later. But of course, I can't just end the video here without the theories that circled around this case, which now leads me to the final part of this video, the speculation on what happened to Dell Williams.
One of the most popular theories, unsurprisingly, revolves around the ex-friend of Dale's, who threw away the missing person flyers. The actions of this individual are extremely suspicious, as surely, even if he was innocent, those kinds of actions would no doubt raise a lot of attention his way. Add to the fact that he clearly had the motive to want to see something bad happen to Dale, and for then Dale himself to go missing, certainly demands looking into. What we know is that both Dale and Diana helped this man's ex-wife flee the state and then refused to give him the information on where she had gone. The shredded pictures and bullets scattered outside of Dale's shop was clearly a threat, and the gun left in the mailbox of Diana's job included her as well. Many believed that this man was directly responsible for Dale's vanishing, and it's not hard to see why. So, you have a person seemingly vanished without a trace, Dell's truck that would later be found 10 feet underwater in a river, and a person who clearly wanted harm to come to Dale. Add these up, and it's not hard to start piecing together, or at the very least, theorizing on what happened. The theory goes that the person who called Dale could have been the same woman who he and Diana helped get out of the state, away from her ex-husband. Due to those events, the man forced the woman to call Dale and make up some story. It could have been that she never even mentioned needing her car jumped in the first place, and could have simply been calling to fake that she needed him to help her. It would explain why the caller who was said by Tom Ross, who was there when the phone call took place, sounded panicked, and that it appeared Dale was speaking to a woman. I mean, needing your car jump started isn't anything fun, sure, but to sound panicked over it seems a little dramatic in my opinion. Dale could have simply said she needed to jump as a cover instead of telling Tom who it really was and why she could have been panicking. And another thing that truly stands out here is Tom Ross would also go on to say in regards to that phone call that the caller didn't sound like they were alone. So the idea that the ex-husband forcing her to make this call while he stood by isn't that hard to picture. Another thing that stands out is Dell stopping by to speak to Tammy Lawrence and letting her know that he was going to help someone who needed their car jumped. Tammy herself went on to say that she found it odd that Dell simply didn't just call her and tell her that. As physically going to see her seemed out of the way. Many people think Dell was doing this to let someone know where he was going, just in case. But why? If this was simply a roadside assistance, why would you let someone know who doesn't even work at the shop? Unless you feared for your safety and were attempting to discreetly let someone know where you were going. Sure, it could be that Tammy's place was on the way to where Dell was going, but still, it's odd that Dell would do any of that. And even more to consider is why even stop to tell Tammy this when someone is waiting for you for mechanical assistance? And with that being the last confirmed sighting of Dale, it makes a lot of those who know this case wonder if the entire phone call was simply a ruse to get Dale out in the middle of nowhere. When you look at what followed, the disappearance, his car being found in a river, a man having motive to harm Dale, and to add even more is that Dale ran a body shop. He wasn't a wrecker or a mechanic. Leaving to go jump a car off wasn't even part of his job. Maybe, yeah, he was simply being nice and helping someone. But me personally? I feel Dell may have actually known who that caller was and went to help them. Some have asked why didn't he just tell Tom who was right there, and yeah, that is a solid point. But given the circumstances, it could have just been easier for him to say, I am going to help someone jump their car, instead of, hey, a year ago I helped this guy's ex-wife leave the state and refused to tell him where she was, and shortly after that he was cryptically threatening me and my wife, and now she is calling me because she needs help. I don't even feel there is a need to cover any other theory on this matter. Sure, it could be that he left willingly, but why? Why abandon your life where you have a business, a wife, and two kids in a town where people respect and like you. There is also no evidence that points to that being the case, or even a possibility. It's almost obvious, and while I can't say for certain what happened, and I don't want to outright accuse anyone, it's hard not to say that foul play wasn't involved. 
And it's not even the phone call or the ex-husband throwing away the flyers that makes me say this. It's the fact that his car was found in a river weeks later. And still, with no sign of a body, it leads me to believe that his truck was put into the river to remove any evidence, even if it were later to be discovered. The entire story of Dale Williams is not only troubling, but it also comes with a lot of contradicting versions online. I have read through numerous articles on Dale, and I have come across people saying that he willingly ran off, that the phone call made to Dale was from a stolen cell phone, and that the man who removed the flyers had a rock solid alibi. I have even seen a few articles mention two different areas where Dale's truck was found. With this kind of back and forth with information, it makes things very difficult when attempting to offer clear and concise research. So, I decided that if I was going to get the most accurate information, then I would need to contact a much better source. Someone who knew Dale. Someone who could tell me much more than any article online. So, that's exactly what I did. Hey, Tony. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? All right, well, we can just start with you stating your name. My name is Tony Lawrence, and I am the oldest daughter of Dale Williams, who's been missing since May 27th, 1999. And if you'd like, uh, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your father was like, you know, memories you may have had with him, or recent memories before his disappearance? Uh, my dad was, he was very involved in his community. He was a wonderful dad. Uh, my sister and I had a fun and memorable upbringing in childhood. Uh, my dad was very involved in his family. We would go camping all the time and picnics up uh, on top of the mountain in between Delta and Nucla. Uh, Colorado because half of his family lived in Delta and the other half lived in New Glove, so that was a convenient meeting place. Um, he was a auto body man all my life, uh, so he would fix cars, he would work on cars, um, he also did some uh, glass repair. Mm -hmm. um, he was a he was a fun community member. He would be Santa Claus for the community and, and kids and he would decorate our house for Halloween and, and uh, pass out candy. He would deliver presents to uh, kids that may not have such a, you know, great um, Christmas, if not. Um, he was just a really fun individual. He was funny. He was uh, kept, he's one of those people that kind of kept you on your toes all the time right and uh he, he was just a really great dad he loved cars he loved old cars working on cars um anything to do with a car he was on it so that's just kind of the person he was he was also the type of individual that would do his shirt you know to somebody in need and um yeah always helpful he would always always go out of his way to help people um, if they ask for it or not. He was very generous individual. All right. And then that seems very appropriate, especially from the things that I've been reading up about him. Um, when it came to the day of his disappearance, obviously you, you know, you know better than pretty much anybody, not, not only the fact that you, it was your father, but just the, countless retellings of it and you being directly involved um is there anything about that day to you uh that stood out as odd like still to this day something that just may have been out of character for your father 
Well, I wasn't living at home at the time of his disappearance. Mm -hmm. Um, My sister was in high school still, and I was in college. So I lived in Delta, and uh, for me, nothing of that day was any different than any other day. How long was it before you found out? Like, did you get a phone call, or did one of your family members come see you to tell you what was going on? Yeah, actually, um, I think they... I think I found out that he was missing um, the day the day after he was missing. I'm going to look at that calendar here. I've actually been asked that question before. Hmm. So let's see. I don't know what the like what the actual day is that he was missing. So the 27th was a Thursday. And, okay, so that seems about right, because then um, I received a phone call. I was in school. I received a phone call from my roommate at the school, or I had called her to see if she could bring me something, something along those lines. And she had told me that my Uncle Tom, who's actually my dad's cousin, Mm -hmm. had... Um, called her to see if she had heard from my dad or if I had and that he had been missing and um, for a day they weren't able to locate him and let's see so I do remember coming home yeah it had to have been on the 28th when I was called because I came I drove home immediately and we drove over the mountain and, um, graduation was the next day. Oh, geez. Yeah. And then they had organized us, a search searches within the town of about probably about 300 people. Maybe, um, I believe that happened on Sunday and Monday. So, um, so yeah, there was, I think it was just one day maybe that had passed and then, um, I had gotten a call, you know, to say that he was missing and, and, uh, I went home right away. So it was basically like an immediate red flag for you that was out of character for your father. Oh yeah. Huge red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, um, now my dad would like work late and come home late, but he always came home. You know, there wasn't there wasn't like any skipped days of him um, not coming home from a day of work. And Nucla, I mean, it's not like we're talking about like, you know, Nucla is very small. We lived, our house was maybe a five minute walk from his shop on body or on uh, main street we literally had to walk a block to get to his his body shop and um i mean you could cut through people's yards and be there within you know five at the most five minutes but if you were to walk around it'd take about probably eight to ten minutes so it was very small and i don't think a lot of people understand how small nucle is it's very small people know what's going on people know your business what you're doing um it's not unusual for people to stop by other people's places of work just to stop in and say hi or you know have a conversation see what they're doing um and it certainly wasn't um unusual for my dad to meet with um like his, he has a really good friend that he would have coffee with, you know, almost every single morning. Right. And, um, that would have been very unusual for him to not see his friend at coffee that, uh, the morning of the 28th. There were, uh, the day of his disappearance following, you know, the next few days, what I was reading were there were, several reports or witness sightings of your father, but they kind of only really boiled down to two with that morning when he was talking to Tom Ross and that afternoon when he stopped by Tammy's house 
uh, or Tammy's place of business uh, to let her know that it was going to be a little bit later in the afternoon before he, he could get to her car because he had to go help a vehicle uh, be jump started. Do like, have you heard or any of your family members heard of like people coming to y'all saying, Oh, I, I saw your dad this day, or I saw your dad the day after. Like, I know I saw him kind of thing. Um, there were some, some people who swore they saw him like driving towards Norwood, um, or, you know, things like that. Like people will say, I swear I saw Dale you mm-hmm. know, driving between Nucla and Natarita. Um, and it, there is a there was a a truck that was owned by somebody else that was almost identical to my dad's truck right and so i think that some of the confusion lies with that that the trucks are similar but um the other truck is freddie smith's and um not my dad's so you know and it's it is I mean, it is possible that people saw, you know, his truck parked somewhere at some point in time because um, after he left to Paradox, he, you know, he that's where he disappeared from and somebody at that point had possession of his vehicle and not him. So, yeah, because it was you know, in such a remote area, I don't think that it is impossible to think that that individual could have, you know, driven his truck and left it at one place for a couple hours or, you know, driven it somewhere else, you know, or like, I don't know, in the middle of the night, parked it next to his shop. So when they saw the truck was there, it could have been there. I don't know. And then moved it again in the middle of the night. And, and Nucla is so small. In the middle of the night, you would be lucky to see anybody out there. Maybe a police officer, but probably not. You, you could probably very easily drive down Main Street in Nucla at 2 o'clock in the morning and be the only car out there. Yeah, that's not uncommon. I grew up in a town where everybody joked and said it was a town that closed at 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much kind of how Nucle is. Um, and now it's even smaller. You know, yeah. when, when I was in school and my dad was alive, there was probably, oh, I would say a good um, 1,200 to 1,400 people maybe. But... Um, over the years, it's just dwindled down. There's, there's not really, uh, unless you're a rancher, there's not really any source of income there. How long has it been since you've last been in, uh, Nucla? Um, I moved away from Nucla in 2001 Mm -hmm. is when I moved to Denver and the last time I went back to Nucla was when my mom's uh, mom, my grandma's funeral was. So that was in, I want to say before 2010. So I haven't been back since. I haven't been back since there and I've gone to Montrose which is just a couple hours from Nucla but I haven't been back to Nucla since my grandma's funeral when you were there were there any you know talks of your father or was it was his name still basically talked about you know all that time later um no I would say that it was business as usual Mm -hmm. and the only time that really there's any chatter, I guess, is when people pick up that the investigators are coming to town or, um, you know, his really good friends will still search the river and, you know, people that, that care about him 
they'll still search the river when it's low or, you know, keep their eye out for things. And, you know, it's been 23 years since it disappeared. So, um, I think 23 years, man. Um, so that, that's the only time really that, that things will come up or, you know, some people will reach out to me and say, Hey, has there been any, has there been any progress on your dad's case? at all and that's about you know the answer is always no so yeah the investigators will chase leads if they feel like it's a um a good lead to chase but uh you know we've heard we've heard every rumor in the rumor mill and i can um, imagine it's just you know people who say Oh, I swear I saw a guy that looks just like Dale Williams in Billings, Montana, and you need to go up there and check and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, people really need to do some research before they reach out to us um, about this kind, those kinds of things to make sure that, you know, that the, it's a credible lead because first of all, our invest, uh, first of all, if it isn't like a realistic thing, like, my dad is not in Billings, Montana. My dad isn't in Cuba. My dad isn't in Mexico. My dad isn't in Jamaica. He's nowhere around there. My dad is dead. My dad is dead, and he was murdered. So unless there is a plausible lead uh, towards those s- specific circumstances, I'm not going to waste my investigator's time with telling them, you know, my, my dad is not in Billings, Montana. He's not in Rhode Island either, or New York, or California. You know, he's he's not in any of those places. So I really do wish that, um, and I know that it's it's out of the kindness of everybody's hearts to reach out if they think that they saw something. And and of course we want, you know, we want people to reach out, but we want it to be plausible, creditable information. Yes, exactly. Do you feel your how you had just stated your father was has died? Do you feel that your father died the day he disappeared? I do, I do. Um, I believe that he. I believe that he stopped by uh, Feral Gas mm-hmm. to see if his friend. Um, his very best friend would go out to the stranded caller's vehicle with him because he felt, you know, he didn't feel safe, so to speak. And um, when, when his friend wasn't available, I feel that he just went out there under the hopes that he was going to, it was, it was actually going to be, you know, what it was led to be Mm -hmm. a stranded person needing help or he believed that he was going out there to talk maybe try to find some resolution in a matter um that he was going through and instead i believe he walked into a gun and that was it so um that's what I think happened. I think that, I think that it was a setup and just because he is a kind person and wanted to give somebody the benefit of the doubt, just in case they were in a, um, situation that they needed assistance, he went ahead and went against his better judgment. Because it was reported that Tom Ross said that it's. It seemed like your father didn't know who was on the other end of the phone. And there have been a lot of people who have also said they feel like your father did know, actually know who was on the other end of the phone. Do you feel, do you feel he knew who it was? Or do you think it was a possibility that he felt this was or could potentially be a setup? Or what do you think? Um, you know, I, I do think that if my dad did recognize the voice that was on the phone or knew who it was, 
I do think that maybe he would have said something else to Tom Ross mm-hmm. um, to kind of um, make it seem like he wasn't as concerned, possibly, or to protect Tom Ross or my mom or my sister. Because my sister was still living at home. Right. You know? So I think that that is a possibility. I especially if it was um, concerning certain individuals in the area. Uh, The other possibility I think might be that um, that he didn't know this person, but my dad was a pretty keen individual. Um, I mean, anybody calling from Paradox is going to know who my dad is. And um, if it was like a out-of-towner person right, calling from Paradox, then they would have, I don't think that they would have known to call my dad, you know? Um, my dad was a body man. He wasn't a tow service or, um, you know, like you know he was just a nice guy and he while he did know how to work on transmissions and things like that he he would go out of his way you know leaving his job and whatever it is that he was doing to go help somebody who he thought was truly in me you know I have no doubt in my mind that 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 he thought that there may have been a possibility that somebody needed help. But the people that live in Nucla and Natarita and Paradox, they know everybody else too. So if it was a jump, why would they call my dad? Why couldn't they just get a jump from somebody else? You know? Yeah, that that did strike me as odd when I was reading it, that they specifically because triple i mean this was 1999 this wasn't you know 1873 triple a was very much a service and it, it would surprise me that even me and i know the very basics of mechanical work i know not to call a body shop for a jump or a tow well it might not have been like I said, Nucla is extremely small, mm-hmm. and um, they may not have. I don't. There isn't like a triple A business, so to speak, in um, in that area, and so I'm not really sure if, like, maybe if it. Okay, let's just say that it was a stranger. Okay. Okay. And they didn't know my dad or anything like that then they probably would have called another like a wrecker service and then if perhaps that they couldn't get out there they may have referred that person to my dad now if that's a stranger now if it was somebody that he knew that he was personable with like you know like if it was if it was like my friend's daughter, like, like his friend's daughter, then, you know, his friend would have asked if he could have gone out and helped her. Right. But, but again, this wasn't like Paradox Valley isn't, I don't even think the call came from Paradox Valley because if somebody were to break down in on that highway between Paradox and Moab, the only store at the time would be the Paradox, um, or it's called the Bedrock Store. Right. And it's just like a little general store, teeny, teeny, tiny, owned by locals. My dad knew the owners, and that individual would have to physically walk to the Bedrock Store in order to make a phone call to, you know, have somebody come and pick him up. I don't think the call even came from that area. I think it came from a landline from somewhere else. Because there was the classic 
theory that the, and even I included this, that the cell phone was reported stolen, but then it came out that that was never proven. Right. Like, there's no record that it was even a cell phone. I I feel like that it's a reported, they say, okay, it's a reported cell phone, then it was, in fact, that your father's truck was, you know, located in the river. And it just... It made me wonder if because your father's truck was found in that river because they never found a body and because, you know, they still label it missing person. I kind of wonder if people added and it was and the phone call was made from a stolen cell phone to kind of in a kind of twisted way in a twisted way, like Hollywood it up, like add more flavor to the whole thing to make it even more mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very possible. Um, like I said, we've heard every rumor that could ever be, you know, told. Um, we've heard drugs, we've heard affairs, we've heard, oh, he just took off. Um, we've heard he's still alive with another family in another country, (laughs) in another city, you know? So yeah, it's very, I would say that that's possible that it was just added in at some point in time, not, um, maybe not intentional, but, um, it did, I would say that that probably did hinder some things, um, early on in the investigation and, um, yeah, I would just, I guess it would just be nice to know, um, some of those, you know, facts, I guess, factual information that, is now it's way too old to even you know you know yeah and um i'm sure that they did try to do a trace but i mean the telephone company in nucla back in 1999 it was it only served nucla natarita um and maybe paradox i don't i don't know but it's i think people take for granted um, nowadays technology and assumptions on how things are, but when it's associated with a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere, I mean, we're, we're a hundred miles plus from a Walmart, you know, a stoplight, right. um, a, a major grocery store, a brand gas station. This isn't like <laughs> you can't walk down to Walmart and replace your tennis shoes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's kind of um, one. It's one of those towns where if you blink, you miss it. Oh yeah, well, and especially Nucla because there's not a direct highway through Nucla. It's um, through Natarita. So yeah, it's you can drive through the whole town in a couple minutes. Yeah. You know? So in one way and right out the other. So obviously, to people who hear this story, one of the biggest you know, red flags is the individual who was throwing away your father's missing persons flyers. Um, do you have any opinions on that, that you'd like to share? Um, so that individual, um, was questioned about the flyers, the missing persons flyers. And, from my knowledge, he didn't really have a reason as to why he was doing that. He was just doing it. I mean, obvious, this is the same individual that my parents helped move his ex-wife out of the state. Right. Um, so, of course, you know, he's going to be angry about that. Um, and, you know, in a sense, I can, I can sympathize that. But my parents... My parents were truly doing something. Um, how you know they were trying to keep somebody safe. Yeah. So, I uh, I definitely don't fault my parents for helping that woman because I mean they may have saved her life, they may have saved her son's life, you know. And I know that he was. I know that that guy was really. He was very great at my parents. So, um, that you know, maybe that 
it's it's really difficult to be able to say yes or no this is why i think that was happening but um you know i guess we'll we won't know until we know <laughs> did you feel like because i know that you're about to have to get back to actually working did you have anything else you'd like to add to the end of this uh anything about uh the website that you run for your father or anything like that um let's see i i you know if you if you hear something or know something credible um please please reach out to the cbi so we can you know put this put this to rest, I guess. And so we can all move on. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody knows anything that might help the investigators with their case, uh, please reach out to them. The story of Dale Williams is truly tragic, most importantly because his family still has no closure. Yes, the absence of nobody seeing him or finding a body for over 20 years could make most simply assume the worst, but you still never fully will know until he is found. I am not flat out accusing anyone here, not even the ex-husband, but I am saying that his actions both before and after Dale's disappearance, at the very least, make me look at him as a person of interest. What is known is that on May 27th, 1999, Dale Williams left to go to work and then hours later reportedly left to help a stranger in need. Since then, over 20 years later, he has not been seen or heard from since, leaving his wife, two kids, and an entire community wondering the what, why, and how of so many questions. If Dale Williams is truly gone, then he should be remembered for his generosity, kindness, and willingness to always lend a helping hand. I want to say a special thank you to Tony for taking the time to discuss her father's case with me. If you or anyone you know have any information on Dale Williams, I urge you to click the link in the description box below that will take you directly to Dale Williams' website that Tony herself runs. Maybe there is someone out there watching this video who knows something that can close this case that has gone unsolved for over 20 years. <laughs>